What is going on everyone, it's Justin here, and after talking about the iPhone SE for a few videos, we finally have it in our hands, and today I'm gonna give you like the information about it, whether you should buy it, and if 399 is as good of a deal as everybody's been telling you. I know a lot of like the early Apple reviews talked about like how this is like the best value of all time, but at its base, it is a very simple upgrade. And with that comes a few new features, but I don't really think it's as big of a deal as a lot are saying. And I think the most exciting thing about it that is driving all the hype is that it starts at a price of $399, which is the same price as the Magic Keyboard for the iPad Pro and cheaper than the wheels they sell for the Mac Pro. For the price of $399, you're getting a phone that has the same 2020 processor that is found on the iPhone 11 and 11 Pro and is arguably more powerful and better optimized than the top flagship phones on the market that cost thousands. Even though I've gone out and bought every iPhone with my own money, including the ones that I give away, and Apple's told me many times not to give any more away. As I promised, I'm gonna be doing a giveaway of an iPhone SE 2020, so stay tuned for the rules at the end of this video. So iPhones have traditionally been known to be at the very high price point in the premium line with the 11 Pro, and then in recent years, they also introduced the 10R and the 11, which are very great deals in my opinion, and are much alike their flagship models. But this is a $399 phone at its starting price point that pretty much shares the same body as the iPhone 8. It is nearly identical. And with a few changes on the inside, including the processor, Apple's able to make this phone very cheap using the same parts as some of their premium devices and some old parts from the iPhone 8 and give you that very competitive price point to get you into the Apple ecosystem. Or for students out there, this is going to be a very popular option. When it comes to the unboxing experience, these phones are very simple. You open it up, you have the phone itself. The setup process is exactly the same. Inside the box, you also have the five watt charger and it would have been nice if they included the 18 watt charger because then they'd only have to make one for all their phones. So after we open up the phone itself, their only visual difference is the fact that the Apple logo is front and center and there's no additional branding on the bottom. I've actually used the iPhone 8 as my backup phone for the past couple years. It is just nice and easy to carry around, very light. So. This doesn't really bring back any nostalgia because I've been using one this whole time. But in terms of the back, if you don't wanna use it with a case, I think it looks great. It comes in red, black, and white, and all three models come with a black front, so no more white front. So other than the logo being like a different location, the bezel is essentially the exact same size. And there was some hope that they were gonna use like the same form factor as like the 10R, um, have it go edge to edge and not have any home button. That ended up being false and everything is essentially the exact same. You cannot tell the difference if you have it in a case. The only big change to this phone though, and I think what we're gonna spend the most time talking about is the processor and the camera. So this device has the Apple A13 chip, which is the same one that you find on the iPhone 11 and 11 Pro. And that is like the latest and greatest in what Apple has for chip technology in smartphones. For $399 phones, Android companies traditionally like to use a cheaper processor like the Snapdragon 700 line as opposed to the 800. And even though at the end of the day, you're not really gonna notice like a huge difference in everyday tasks from a 700 to an 800, in this case, you have the best chip that Apple currently has. That is 1.4 times faster than the chip on the original iPhone 8, as well as two times faster in GPU for gaming performance. But I just honestly don't feel like gaming is gonna be your first priority if you're buying a phone of this size. I think most of the benefits that you're going to find in the chip technology is in the camera, and it kind of bridges the gap between the previous generation phones and the newest generation iPhone 11, which has multiple cameras. When it comes to photos though, on paper, it is the exact same sensor and hardware as on the iPhone 8, which may be a little bit disappointing, but the Apple A13 allows for some of the new features that we find on current phones on this $399 model. And in daylight photos, you're able to actually get pretty solid results. And in terms of video, it is gonna be much better than any other phone that you're gonna find for 399. The Smart HDR, as we've seen with Apple flagships, has been excellent. And even compared to some of the 2020 Android phones, it still has some of the better dynamic range out there. But in terms of like resolution and detail, it is definitely behind. Honestly though, I was pretty happy with the results overall, but I do also plan on doing a cinematic video using a moment case and an anamorphic lens to see what the 4K video capability is on Apple's cheapest device. Another feature that has also been talked about a lot that I personally don't really use that much is depth control in a single camera setup. Nowadays, I think depth cameras are a combination of software and hardware, and Google has very well demonstrated in the past couple years that having just a single camera is able to achieve great results with good AI. Apple has also started to in the past couple years, but in this device, you're able to do portrait images as well as the six studio lighting modes. And I will say it does have more of an artificial look compared to like the iPhone 11 and 11 Pro as expected. It does have very strong cutting on the edges, but it does get the job done.
This phone is able to record 4K30, 4K24, as well as 4K60 with improved dynamic range and also stereo audio recording. So overall, in terms of the camera, when we were talking about like rumors and stuff, I was hoping that the phone would use like an iPhone 11 camera, similar to when the iPhone SE had the same camera as a flagship that year. But for $399 and its single camera setup, I will say you should be pretty satisfied at that price. One feature that is missing though is night mode. And when you look at the comparison between the iPhone 11 Pro and the iPhone SE, you can tell that there is a big difference. And that is because the iPhone 11 has one of the best low light performances for any phone. So if you really want that and are gonna be taking a lot of photos at night, then you're gonna have to spend the extra money. When it comes to doing everyday tasks, so I can say with confidence that the A13 combination with three gigs of RAM is gonna give you great performance for everyday tasks and even gaming, as well as photo editing and even video editing on apps like Visco. I don't really like doing like any iMovie stuff on a phone. And I think with Apple's chips being so well optimized with their own ecosystem, that has allowed them to not really have to improve anything else in this phone to offer it as a new one in 2020. And it really felt like my iPhone 8 in 2020 was slow or anything, but occasionally if you wanna like edit a photo or do something a little bit more demanding, then there might be like the occasional hiccup here and there. And obviously on the Apple A13, you're not gonna notice that at all. So in the conversation of battery life, this phone has an 1821 milliamp hour battery. And that is pretty much the same as what we saw on the iPhone 8, which can be disappointing in some aspects because the phone no longer has 3D touch. And with that comes a thinner display assembly and you would expect that the battery life is just a little bit bigger. I've never had great battery life on the iPhone 8 and I am a power user when I do use that device. But being a small phone, if you're a casual user, you should be able to get through an entire day. But if you are a power user, then you might run into some problems. But thankfully you can charge it at 50% in 30 minutes if you buy the 18 watt charger, which is gonna cost you extra money. So if you're coming from like an iPhone 7 or 8, don't expect any improvements in terms of battery life. On the display side of things, I've left this all the way to the end because there really isn't anything new. It is the exact same 4.7 inch Retina HD display that is 1334 by 768 and a 326 PPI and a max brightness of 625 nits, but you do have True Tone as well. The phone itself also has Wi-Fi 6 compared to Wi-Fi 5, which gives you 38% improvement in speed. And it also gives you 60% improvement in LTE speeds compared to the iPhone 8. I think what makes the iPhone's approach a little bit unique though is that because the chip on the iPhones have been so well optimized within their own ecosystem, that for $399, you're almost getting a more powerful chip than the top Android phones with Snapdragon 865s right now. So at the end of the day, when you look at the lineup, you have the $399 phone that starts with 64 gigs of storage, as well as the $699 for the iPhone 11 and the $1,000 for the iPhone 11 Pro. And that is just like a huge range, both in terms of size and price. So it does make the decision very tough because the iPhone 11 is not even close to the same price as the iPhone SE. So I don't really think they're comparable, but at the same time, the iPhone 11 has like the new screen with the bezels that go all the way around to the edge. You've got like the newer technologies, the dual camera setup with a great wide angle cam and also the new sensor and stuff. But once you factor it in, it is nearly double the price. So the iPhone SE still very much has its own space in the lineup. So if you're just looking for like a simple phone and you're coming from like the iPhone 6, the 5, or even the 7 or 8, then the iPhone SE is gonna be a very familiar option that has the necessary improvements to bring you to 2020, many software updates for like the next five years at least. And if you're coming from the outside, gets you into the Apple ecosystem as well. But on the other hand, it is definitely not a phone that is exciting, new, or futuristic in any way whatsoever because it still has like that small screen, the bezels, and the home button, and it looks the same as a phone that came out three years ago. But at 399, who really cares? If you're also looking to buy your kid the first phone because they're probably gonna drop it or lose it, then the iPhone SE is a very safe option. Other than that though, I feel like all the hype is in its price. There really isn't anything that is too exciting other than that, aside from a very attractive entry-level price point for a traditionally expensive lineup of phones. And it's nice to have the updates. It's nice that the camera has been improved as well. But other than that, I think it is more of like an incremental change that doesn't really pose anything else that is groundbreaking. As I promised though, I'm also gonna be giving away a phone, so just make sure you subscribe to the channel, drop a like on this video, and leave a comment down below, and also follow me over on Instagram at justin.tse, and I'll be announcing a winner in the comment section in three weeks. Thank you guys so much for watching this video, and I'll see you all in the next one.